Good evening. I'm Mike Perry. I'm the president of the Army Heritage Center Foundation. The foundation is the friends group for the U.S. Army Heritage Education Center, a component of the Army War College, and one of the leading repositories for the history and heritage of our soldiers and the U.S. Army. If you've not been here, we would invite you to visit both for the archival facilities that we have, but also for the museum exhibits in the Army Heritage Trail. Tonight, we're pleased to have Lieutenant Colonel retired Timothy Stoy. Uh, he served 31 years as an infantry officer and as a foreign area officer. He is a graduate of the United States Military Academy at West Point and earned a master's degree at Georgetown University. Tim served as a historian of the Society for the 3rd Infantry Division and is currently the president and historian of the 13th Infantry Association. Among his many honors, Tim is a recipient of the Society of 3rd Infantry Division Audie Murphy Award. Tim, the floor is now yours. You're going to talk about an interesting gentleman tonight, aren't you? I, I sure think so. i uh, spent a lot of time learning about him, 12 years trying to research and write the book. So thank you very much for having me, Mike. It's a great honor to be invited to speak uh, through the foundation. I want to thank you for the invitation. I want to like to thank uh, my publisher, Casemate, who made this book possible, uh, Joe Craig and the R AUSA book program who chose to add this to their to their books for this year. Also a plug for the AHEC, which played a major role in my ability to do the necessary research because you all have Iron Mike's uh, professional papers and his photos. And also to the Ridgeway uh, Family Military History Research Grant, which was given to me in 2019, which enabled me to come up to Carlisle and spend significant amount of time pouring through all the information you have there. So thank you very much. And uh, again, thank you for joining me. I'd like to talk about Iron Mike O'Daniel. Why, why does Iron Mike O'Daniel deserve a book? Why is he worth a book? Well, a little bit of history, you touched on it. Uh, my first assignment in the Army was with the 3rd Infantry Division. I was a lieutenant. Uh, and they did a really good job of teaching us the division's history. So we learned about World War II in Korea, World War I. And then in a subsequent tour as a major, I was a Division G5 and uh, attended all the ceremonies on behalf of our commanding general, General L.D. Holder, uh, for the commemoration of the 50th anniversary of everything World War II in France and Germany. And during these, these years that I was there, met many fine World War II veterans from the 3rd Division, and it was uniform. They praised their two division commanders, Lucian K. Truscott, served up through uh, Anzio, and then Iron Mike O'Daniel, who took them through the last 15 months of the war. So their stories were compelling. I mean, he left an impression wherever he went. Some people would call it awake uh, because he was really aggressive and always moving and pushing, pushing, pushing. And then as I got a little older and had a little bit more time on my hands and became the society historian, I had access to some of the files from the various periods of the division service. And there was a lot of stuff about Iron Mike O'Daniel. In it. So I started reading it and I was impressed by how tough and an aggressive and relentless commander he was. He wasn't a counter puncher. He was constantly throwing punches. He was a practitioner of the art of war, not a theoretician. We'll cover that later as we get into World War II. And when I read many history books, uh, he was highly respected by his superiors and his peers. And the great thing about his services, he started in 1914 with the militia, retired in 56. So his is also the story of the United States Army in the first half of the 20th century. And in my research, there are many fascinating little cul-de-sacs I could go into and little connections to people who are important in history. And then finally, uh, in my reading and study of World War II especially, I find that uh, most of the writing concentrates on army level commanders or even higher with the general marshal. Sometimes they get down to corps commanders, but very few division commanders were actually covered in full length biographies, unless they'd gone up and promoted up to corps command or army command during the war. So I said, let's sort of fill that void. So here we are, and that's uh, and you can see Iron Mike O'Daniel. He has a he has a pretty e expressive face. Uh, I wouldn't have wanted to have been called into his office not having accomplished the mission he assigned. So let's begin the journey. So this is the earliest picture I was able to find of uh, 
John Wilson O'Daniel, who was born in 1894 in Oxford, Pennsylvania. And he lived there until 1910 when he was a senior in high school. This is his high school football photo. He was a quarterback and place kicker for the football team at Oxford. And he also played some baseball as a catcher for the high school team. In 1910, his mother passed away and he and his younger brother, Al, were sent to live with their maternal grandmother and two aunts in New Ark, Delaware, which is about 10 miles away from, from Oxford, while his, parent, while his father was busy running a 150-acre dairy farm. Fast forward five years, he's at the University of Delaware. Here he is as a sophomore. Uh, he's matured some, you can see. You can see the grit and the determination in his face already, but he's still smaller than the majority of his peers. Sometime in the course of his college career, he picked up the nickname Mike. I've been unable to determine through any papers or anywhere why he's called Mike. Uh, I have a theory that back in the early 1900s, you had the appearance of one of the new comic strips in the newspapers, Mike and Ike. But I have never been able to figure out who the Ike would have been. But again, he was very active in college. As you can see, this is from his uh, junior yearbook. The many activities is what he was in. He was in ROTC as a first lieutenant in the, in the Alpha Company of their, their unit there. But he was also, from 1914 on, a member of Echo Company of the Delaware Militia, which was headquartered in Newark. And he was very active with that company. He was uh, on the marksman, very good at marksmanship, usually in the top five whenever they had shooting competitions. And his brother, Al, was one year behind him and was also in the same unit and usually shot just as well or better. This was Iron Mike's military career prior to. World War II. I've touched on 1914 to 1917, he served with the Delaware Militia and later the National Guard when it was federalized to uh, go to the Mexico border between New Mexico and Mexico during the border expedition against Pacho Villa. The National Guard folks guarded the American border while the regular forces went in and tried to catch him. And he was in Deming, New Mexico for a period of about eight months, which kept him from actually completing his college. But we'll talk about that later. Upon his return, he finished one, one more semester at Delaware and then attended officer uh, training camp at Fort Myer, Virginia, where he and 4,999 other candidates selected from National Guard units from along the East Coast, went through fairly rudimentary training to determine if they could be semi-functional junior leaders. And then those who did well would get their commissions. And he graduated and attended May to August 1917, graduated in August, and was offered a regular Army commission in October based on his performance. He was uh, sent to Fort Oglethorpe in Georgia and reported as a lieutenant in the 11th Infantry Regiment of the 5th Division. His company commander was a young lieutenant named of, uh, Mark Wayne Clark, who had just graduated from West Point in the class of April 1917. Uh, this is a relationship which had in more enormous impact on Iron Mike's future in the Army. And we'll talk a bit about his World War I service in our next slide. And then after he returned from World War I, he would serve as a company commander with the 2nd Battalion of the 25th Infantry Regiment, a black regiment in Nogales, Arizona, then as an advisor to the National Guard in New Jersey, attend the company commander's course at Fort Benning, and then serve as first a company commander in the 20, 21st Infantry in Hawaii, and then as an MP detachment commander. Here's a picture of Sergeant O'Daniel shortly after his promotion. He went to New Mexico as a private and got promotions to corporal and to sergeant, and he was his company's supply sergeant. And as you can see, they were living in tents. Luckily, it was the Southwest and not somewhere colder. Now, in World War I, his brother, also having attended the OTC, joined the Air Corps. And unfortunately, he was killed in an aircraft accident in July of 1918. And he is still buried in the Wazan Cemetery uh, in Champagne region of France. We visited his grave several years ago when we were in France. Al's death, that was his nickname, hit the whole family hard, but especially Mike, because they'd grown up together and uh, imbued, I think, uh, General O'Daniel with a intense dislike, if not hatred, of the Germans. 
This is a picture of uh, O'Daniel as a temporary captain after the end of World War I. He'd served as a platoon leader, uh, line platoon, and then a recon platoon leader for his regiment in the Vosges Mountains initially. And then when General Clark, or then Lieutenant Clark was wounded by artillery fire, took over temporary command of K Company and commanded it in the San Miguel offensive, being wounded in the head. You can see the scar on his cheek and then returned in time to lead it again through the Meuse Argonne with the great success and pride. This is his distinguished service cross citation, basically saying he was severely wounded in the head early in the action and continued to command his unit for several more hours until he was forced by complete physical exhaustion to uh, give up the mission and go for medical treatment. Something I learned in my research lessons is at the end of World War I, they had all these victory ceremonies and parades in Europe. And General Pershing was expected to attend and the units, I mean, the United States needed a ceremonial unit to parade in all these different ceremonies. So they formed the provisional regiment uh, and selected based on recommendations from regimental commanders and division commanders outstanding soldiers to serve in this regiment. And Iron Mike was selected to be a company commander of H Company Provisional Regiment. And in this capacity, he participated in all the victory ceremonies in Europe. And in his last one was after they returned from France, was in Washington, D.C. in September of 1919 for the Grand Victory Parade down the Pennsylvania Avenue. Shortly thereafter, the unit was inactivated. He had reported to his next unit which was in Nogales, Arizona, as I'd mentioned before, 25th Infantry Regiment, which had missed World War I, uh, but many World War I veterans, officers especially, were being posted there after the war. This is a picture of, uh, of Mike O'Daniel and his wife, new wife, Ruth Bowman, whom he met shortly after arriving in Nogales with the 25th. The interesting thing about this relationship is Ruth Bowman's uncle, who was also sort of her foster father, because her father was no longer in the picture, was the mover and shaker in Nogales, had established the bank, the brewery, the hotel, had a lot of money, dual-based San Diego, Nogales, lots of uh, business uh, connections to Mexico. So he married into a good situation, but no indications in my later research that he ever tried to use those political connections to his advantage within the army. And this is just a view of their barracks. It was, uh, again, pretty Spartan living out there in the, in the Arizona desert. This is a picture of Mike with his company. Good looking soldiers. I've got, Gen I mean, Captain O'Daniel circled in red for you there. He spent three years in this assignment. Moving on. He moved uh, back east uh, after having been gone for over 10 years uh, to be closer to his family. He managed to get a, an assignment to Fort Howard, Maryland. He was a company commander in the 12th Infantry Regiment. And particularly noteworthy in 1933 was a five month TDY with the Gold Star Mother's Pilgrimage in New York City, which was the port of embarkation for all these ladies going to visit the graves of their sons or their husbands. And uh, notable, Two things were notable about, about this uh, particular assignment. One, the senior officer at the Port of Embarkation was Colonel Benjamin O. Davis Sr., the senior black officer on duty at that time in the Army. And two, he was able to escort his two aunts to visit his brother's grave in France on this TDY. Returning from TDY, he was assigned to the 22nd Infantry Regiment at Fort McPherson, Georgia and had dual, dual responsibilities as a company commander in the 22nd at the same time with the Triple C, which the 22nd was supporting at that time. Initially in charge of several camps, he became the Army Liaison Officer to the Tennessee Valley Authority, uh, which was the largest Triple C project at that time, and, and also gained him recognition and contacts with high-ranking civilians in the states that you see, Georgia, Tennessee, and North Carolina. Having excelled at that job, he was a professor of military science and tactics at the Academy of Richmond County in Augusta, Georgia, a prominent school at the time, did well there, then selected for command and general staff college. Uh, 
average student at best, his uh, academic efficiency report signed by General McNair, who was the commandant at the time said, not suitable for further military education due to poor academic performance. So this would have been a death knell had, uh, had the hostilities of World War II not come. I think his strengths lie not in the academic field, but rather in uh, pushing troops. Here's a photo of uh, General or Mike O'Daniel with his, his MP detachment at Fort Shafter, Hawaii. Interesting is his XO who, who's sitting to his right, Tom Davies, his, uh, his widow eventually become Iron Mike's second wife after Ruth Bowman, Bowman O'Daniel passed away in 1965. But we'll touch on that later. This is uh, O'Daniel again with the officers of the 22nd. The infantry seated next to Colonel Baltzell, a highly respected infantry officer of his time. So important to the infantry school that they actually named Baltzell Avenue, one of the major avenues through Fort Benning after him. And now we get to the meat of what really made uh, General O'Daniel's career. 1941, he was selected to command a battalion, this time in the 24th Infantry Regiment. This would be his second assignment with black troops. He excelled with this unit. Uh, it did very well in the Louisiana maneuvers. And as a result, he was selected by name by General Kruger, who was the Third Army commander, to run the Third Army Junior Officers Training Center, Camp Bullis, Texas. I'm sorry, I also lost one up there. He had an assignment at Camp Brady, Michigan, where he ran the Junior Officer Training Center there, basically trying to turn civilians into material that could serve in the Army. In July 42 is when Mark Clark reached down and grabbed him. Uh, General Clark was working with General Eisenhower and building up the American presence in the United Kingdom for the future, hopefully coming soon, cross-channel attack. And he reached out and had O'Daniel assigned as the director of the Amphibious Training Center in the United Kingdom. He served there up until October uh, under the watchful eye of Mark Clark and uh, General Eisenhower did very well. He saw all the units that were being trained. There was a need in the 34th Division for a regimental commander of the 168th, and he received that command in October, prepared the unit for a month, and then landed with it at Algiers or just outside of Algiers in November of 1942. Accomplished the, the mission uh, very successfully despite some really difficult challenges. The Navy dropped his regiment 12 miles off target and through forced march that night, he still managed to get them to Algiers. In December, he was promoted to Brigadier General. He was 591 out of a list of 592, uh, almost the most junior brigade uh, Brigadier General in the Army. But as a general, he was once again grabbed by General Clark to the 5th uh, Army staff, which was being formed at that time, and again, given command of the 5th Army Invasion Training Center in Arjev, Algeria. He ran... And that up until July, preparing all the units that were preparing to go to Sicily and also for the follow on, which they expected to be in Italy. In this capacity, he was seen by every senior officer who went through and he viewed every unit and saw their capabilities. Uh, he landed with the third division, which was the central part of Joss Force, almost 60,000, the division reinforced by many additional units under Lucian Truscott. The span of control so large, the General Eisenhower felt he needed another general officer to help supervise. So they sent Iron Mike to take care of the landing beaches, which he was an expert at. He served with the 3rd ID there for only several weeks, but pulled back more planning at the 5th Army, and then was assigned again temporarily as an assistant, an additional assistant commander with the 36th Division at Salerno, for which he would receive a silver star from General Walker, who had served with him as a senior lieutenant in Nogales, Arizona, interestingly enough. And in, 19, in November 43, he was permanently assigned as the assistant division commander for the third division under General Truscott. And after General Lucas was relieved and Truscott took the sixth corps at Anzio, he took over the division in February 44 and fought it all the way until the end in May and stayed in command until July of 1945. Here we have a picture with Walter Kruger. General Walter Kruger uh, wrote outstanding efficiency reports for O'Daniel. I'm pretty sure that's what got him promoted to Brigadier General. 
and sent him a wonderful note, uh, personal note, congratulating him on his selection for promotion. Then we see on the, the next picture, you have O'Daniel with King George VI and uh, Mark Clark at the Fifth Army Training Center observing training. And this is one of my favorite pictures. This is General O'Daniel with the one star with General Marshall and General Patton watching amphibious training off the coast of Algeria in preparation for the landing in Sicily. This is a shameless plug for my old division. This shows you the route that they took for the majority of the war with uh, General O'Daniel taking a part in the Sicily landings, the Salerno landings, and then going on from uh, when he was assigned to division in November up through um, the landings in southern France, fighting through France into Germany and ending in Austria. This is a picture of O'Daniel as division commander sometime about April time frame before the breakout from the Anzio beachhead. Uh, he was looking pretty haggard, just an indication of how, how difficult the fighting and the conditions were within the beachhead for all the units that were serving there. General O'Daniel, like I said, was not a theoretician. He was more of a practitioner, and he was trying to find a way to add mobility uh, to his infantry. Uh, the Germans had dominant positions, they had a lot of firepower, and he was discovering that they, that the soldiers were sort of tired of advancing uh, against all these intensive uh, fire belts that the Germans had established. So he tried to, he had these battle sleds uh, created, welded together, and in those sleds is where the infantrymen would lay down on their backs and be pulled behind an M4 who would get them into a position and then it was time, basically early mechanized infantry to dismount, they get out and they charge the objective. Problem was, is the soldiers had no idea where they were going because they were looking up and not forward. Uh, they were bouncing around jostled so they, most of them were quite ill and they were sucking the exhaust fumes from the tanks. So it was a failed experiment, but a worthy try to try to inject a little bit more maneuver and survivability for the infantry. The great thing for O'Daniel was is he had fantastic relationships with the Navy, beginning from 1942 when he was running the amphibious training center in the United Kingdom, all the way through the exercise, I mean, the landings operations at Sicily and at Salerno. And this is his Navy battle buddy, Admiral Frank Lowry, who was the one who delivered them to the beaches of Provence on the 15th of August. This was the day before. Uh, they exchanged wonderful correspondence. I've quoted one of the letters in the, in the book uh, of how important O'Daniel felt that successful landings were to really give him the third division a great head start into, uh, into the Southern France campaign. Here we have a picture of Mrs. O'Daniel and John Wilson O'Daniel Jr. as he was graduating from the Airborne School at Fort Benning. Uh, one of the sad chapters of General O'Daniel's uh, life was that his son was killed in action with Alpha Company of the 505th Parachute Infantry Regiment of the 82nd Airborne Division in Holland on the 20th of uh, September 1944, just outside the town of Mook. He was initially uh, reported as MIA and then several weeks later determined to be KIA and uh, the it was Devastating news, of course, for General O'Daniel, but he had a war that he was fighting. Mrs. O'Daniel took it very hard. General O'Daniel sent his chaplain up with several items to have placed in the graves. If you could please hold the questions until uh, the final, the, the end of the briefing, I'd appreciate it. But the, uh, he received a letter from a sergeant who had served in the, I mean, the company headquarters with young O'Daniel told him that what had happened is he was shot by an enemy machine gun as they were advancing through the hedgerows. It was uh, devastating things, but O'Daniel was quite philosophical about it. He wrote a letter to his best friend in the Army, uh, Major General Lowell Rooks, who was working for Eisenhower and his staff. Yeah, they'd served together both at the Provisional Regiment and also in Nogales. He says, Dear Lowell, thank you for your fine letter after having received a condolence letter. It has been tough losing the young fellow. However, such are the misfortunes of war and should be expected. I am grateful, though, that if he had to go, he went as he did, attacking the enemy. 
I was informed he was struck down with a machine pistol while advancing the morning of September 20th and died immediately. I have sent one of our chaplains to get more details. I learned subsequently uh, that one of those items, he actually awarded a silver star to his son. So uh, interesting, sad story, part of uh, O'Daniel's story. Now, General O'Daniel was blessed. He took over a very good division. General Truscott, of course, rightly deserves the fame that he has as an outstanding division commander. But uh, O'Daniel kept it good, which is probably a harder challenge sometimes than making a bad unit good. And the secret was is that uh, despite all the casualties that they, they took in the Italy campaign and at Anzio and, and through the fighting in the Vosges Mountains was that they always had a secret of growing their own leaders. Each one of these commanders, the regimental commanders had started uh, in the third division in the period of 43 and worked their way up. So Hallett Edson commanding the 15th infantry had been a company and battalion commander before moving up to be the regimental commander when the commander had a heart attack in the, in the Vosges mountain fighting. Heinkus had been a company commander, battalion commander, regimental XO in the 30th infantry before taking over in December of 1944 uh, for the 7th Regiment. Colonel McGar had been in command since October of 1943 with the regiment. He was the senior regimental commander. But uh, Iron Mike's secret to success for the 3rd Division was is rapidly getting the replacements in and then instituting intense training program at all quiet moments, even when they were in combat in rear areas. Uh, his, his training guidance to all of his commanders is to say, prepare your soldiers for what's coming. You don't have time to learn it while you're fighting. It was outstanding. And incidentally, all three of the com regimental commanders were West Pointers, as was the chief of staff, Colonel Johnson, but the assistant division commander, Colonel uh, Young, was, uh, was a ROTC graduate from Maryland. This, uh, when you look at the third division history, I can't give you the whole scheme of maneuver. You just have to read the book, hopefully. Uh, but this is seen as O'Daniel's tactical masterpiece. His maneuver to break through the, uh, the German defensive uh, positions in the Colmar pocket in Elsass around the city of Colmar and assist the first French army in collapsing that pocket and evicting the last German soldiers that were still fighting on the west side of the Rhine River. Uh, the secret was is never giving the enemy a pause by constant aggressive action, but also a great deal of misdirection by sliding regiments behind and to the left and to the right of one another. Uh, and the great thing about this battle, it was recognized by the commander of the first French army, General Jean uh, de Latte de Tassigny, with the Entire division with attachments being awarded the French Croix de Guerre, Fourager, and General O'Daniel himself getting the Legion of, I mean, the Legion of Honor, and a great number of uh, officers being decorated separately with the Croix de Guerre individual version and also with, with other decorations. The interesting thing is, from the third division perspective, there were nine medals of honor awarded for fighting in the Colmar pocket area, 30, uh, 23 distinguished service crosses and 351 silver stars just in the space of a month and a half. That's one of the things I'd like to bring up now uh, before I forget is, is General O'Daniel along with General Truscott believed in recognizing valor. Uh, they had a very effective procedure for how commanders could recommend soldiers for value for valor awards and had a mechanism in place at the Division G1 for those awards to be properly prepared, written up correctly with proper grammar so that they weren't kicked back just because they weren't meeting some format or some style requirements. After a successful campaign in Elsass, they prepared to break through the West Wall. Here's General O'Daniel briefing his Corps Commander of 15th Corps, General Wade Hayslip, and General Patch, you can see looking over the shoulder there. They had the tough nut of breaking through the West Wall in the vicinity of Zweibrücken, uh, but Iron Mike's solution to getting through there was dumping a ton of artillery on Zweibrücken and then forcing his units through the Dragon's Teeth, which it took three days for the division to do, but it did. 
uh, it's, it's also an amazing combat feat. It's a very successful campaign through southern Germany. The Red, I mean, the division liberated uh, Bamberg. And after three days fighting in conjunction with the 45th Division, took the heavily defended Nuremberg, had a great ceremony in the Zeppelin Field area, the Nazi party grounds, where five third division men were awarded the Medal of Honor and numerous other decorations awarded to other soldiers. This is where the division ended up, uh, despite what Spielberg and uh, and Ambrose say the first unit into the Obersalzburg and the Eagle's Nest was the 3rd Division, particularly or specifically the 7th Infantry Regiment commanded by Colonel Heikus. And this is the flag raising ceremony on the morning of the 5th of May, 1945, on the ruins of what would have been Goebel's house, uh, pardon me, Goering's house, uh, not far from Hitler's Berkhof. Uh, this was the, the important thing to note here is it was not originally the 3rd Division's objective. It was supposed to be the 101st or the 1st French Armored Division, but the 3rd Division, which was assigned the objective of Salzburg, managed to get there so fast, Salzburg surrendered without fighting. The 3rd Division was in place to go across the core boundary with the authorization of the Army commander and take Salzburg. So pride of place and pride of time goes to the 3rd Division for the Eagle's Nest. So having had a very successful uh, time as a division commander, General Marshall chooses him, O'Daniel, to be the commanding general of Fort Benning, which means he had to oversee the capturing of all the lessons learned, the restructuring of the infantry based on those lessons learned, fielding new equipment, building down an 8 million man army, which had a great deal of infantry in it, restructuring the infantry school to the new realities and budget constraints did this job very well. Then he had perhaps the most interesting assignment of his career. He was assigned as the military attache in Moscow, Soviet Union, just as the Cold War was heating up. Uh, never found any of the decision papers as to why. My guess is we wanted a hard-nosed, no baloney, war-fighting general there to stare down the Soviets. And he was the right man to do it. Uh, he was uh, pugnacious, aggressive, didn't go out of the way to cause any trouble, but he didn't back down when it came. And uh, he left uh, Moscow uh, persona non grata, uh, supposedly because he was taking photographs of things that he was not supposed to do. Uh, returning from Moscow, he was assigned as the inspector of infantry at Army Field Forces, Fort Monroe, once again working for Mark Clark. And then in 1951 was named commanding general of I Corps in Korea, caught the last months of the war of maneuver uh, before the truce talks took hold and very aggressive offensive action was limited uh, to just small unit attacks along the DMZ. Uh, great, greatly frustrating to both uh, General O'Daniel and his boss, General Van Fleet, both known for being aggressive commanders uh, and they tried very hard to keep their units sharp and on, 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 uh, yeah, on point because no soldier wanted to be the last guy to die when these truce talks were happening, but you still were in a war. That was his great challenge there. 1952, he was moved to the commanding general, U.S. Army Pacific, but his big thing in this time, he became the eyes and ears for General Eisenhower and the Joint Chiefs of Staff, what was happening in Indochina, French Indochina. He did three to four inspection visits to try to buck up General Navarre uh, to get the French a, a little bit more aggressive in facing the Viet Minh. It was a hard slog. Uh, the French were tired. They didn't really have the combat capability anymore, but Eisenhower was concerned. We're sending $400 million to the French. What are they doing with it? Uh, so once the Dien Bien Phu occurred and the French decided to negotiate a negotiated settlement, the uh, General Daniel was assigned as the first commander or chief of the military advisory and assistance group Vietnam. Previously, it had been all of Indochina, which included Laos and Cambodia. Uh, his major accomplishment, major uh, challenge at that time 
for the majority of his time in that position was repatriating 750,000 North Vietnamese refugees that were allowed to move south under the Geneva Accords. The newly formed government of South Vietnam was incapable of doing it on its own. They just didn't have the capability. So he was the man on the ground. And at the same time, he came up with the force structure, which was uh, adjusted a little bit by the chairman of the Joint Chiefs and the Chief Staff of the Army to, uh, to build a viable South Vietnamese Army on which President Diem of Vietnam could rely uh, for security and also as the, that buttress for his authority as the president. General Daniel retired Jan in February of 1956 on his 62nd birthday. He had been extended past his management retirement date by General Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, because he was so important in that job in Vietnam. He became president of the American Friends of Vietnam, working out of San Diego, California. He was, uh, this was a lobbying effort to try to build congressional and public support for South Vietnam. In 1963, shortly before the assassination of President Diem, he resigned over differences with the uh, administration and the other members of the American Friends of Vietnam Board of Directors as to the level of support they should continue to give ZM as ZM had fallen out of favor with the United States at that time. After leaving that post uh, between 1963 and 1975, he wrote, he spoke on num in numerous uh, occasions and publications primarily about the war in Vietnam, always in support of, of the South Vietnamese government and then unfortunately he dies 1975 in March, uh, shortly before a planned Fifth Army reunion uh, on the East Coast. But fortunately for him, I think this would have broken his heart before Saigon fell and the Vietnam War ended with South Vietnam losing. This is General O'Daniel with uh, General Eisenhower. And Mike visited uh, Fort Benning. And Mike was the infantry school commandant. This is a picture from his time in Moscow. I've got a uh, red circle around Iron Mike there. Uh, some of you who've been around longer might recognize sort of the man in the middle. That's Andre Gromyko, who in my time when I was younger was the foreign secretary for the Soviet Union. This is Iron Mike when he came back and was the uh, inspector of infantry, once again, working for Mark Clark. This is when he's the I Corps commander visiting his beloved 3rd Infantry Division. Uh, wouldn't have wanted to have been the 3rd Division commander. I think he would have given it special attention. And yes, the 3rd Division was with I Corps most of the time of Ike's command. At Corps level command and during quiet, quieter period of the war, there are a lot of civic support missions in the I Corps area. One of uh, Iron Mike's priorities was the building and support of orphanages for the many Korean orphans uh, caused by the war. This is a great Army history picture with uh, Generals Ridgeway, Van Fleet, and Clark, all of whom Iron Mike had, had, dealt, had dealt with in the course of his career various times. This is General Daniel receiving an award from President, President Rhee of South Korea. This is Iron Mike as the Army Pacific Commander. One of his tours out to visit the troops uh, through the Delta, through the swamps, riding on elephants. I don't know how many of our generals have had the opportunity to do inspection tours on it using an elephant. This is General O'Daniel at his retirement with Chief of Staff of the Army, Max Taylor having received his fourth Army Distinguished Service Medal after having recently received the Navy Distinguished Service Medal in December for his actions uh, resettling the refugees and working with the Navy. As I, as I noted, he was a loyal and dedicated supporter of President Diem of South Vietnam. He visited South Vietnam twice after he left uh, MACV. Uh, this is his visit in 1958. Welcome General Daniel to the Vietnam Military Academy. He really tried hard uh, to make the Vietnamese Armed Forces viable and a valuable support for the government. Uh, he may not have been up to uh, 
fully in the understanding of the entire political situation that President Ziem and the country faced, but he understood well that uh, what a capable army needed to be able to do. In 1960, he wrote a book called The Nation That Refused to Starve. It's uh, meant to illustrate to the American people the great efforts that the South Vietnamese government, especially President Ziem, have gone to to try to improve the lot of the average Vietnamese in South Vietnam. It's a, it's a short book, it's a simple book, but it is very uh, praising of the ever, efforts of President Ziem's regime. During his tours fighting against communists and then as uh, the attache in Moscow, Iron Mike developed an intense dislike, if not hatred of communists. He wrote in 1951, after his experience in Moscow, a, a treatise, a presentation, the combat principles of the Cold War, which he presented to the Army War College in March of 1951, in which he tries to tell everybody, look guys, the Soviet communists, they don't view everything as war and peace. Everything's war, it's either hot or cold. So they're using principles, the objectives of the principles of war, even in peacetime with you know, unity of effort, massive, all these things, the excellent treaties. Uh, he tried to sell it to the State Department and other people and uh, he wrote in frustration in 1974 to his son and said, yeah, I sent all this to everybody and so what, nobody listened. Then when you take the old warrior and you, he's reaching sort of near the end and he gets to be a grandfather. Uh, this is Gretchen Kitts, O'Daniel um, with her grandson, uh, Tom Davies, and Iron Mike looking entirely different than he does in all of his command photos. And what's really great here, we have uh, fantastic quotes here that I like. Uh, the one from General Kruger, he's loyal, superiors and, and his subordinates, devoted, Born leader, recommend for promotion to Brigadier General. I love the one from Admiral Stump. In conclusion, I apologize for the length of the dispatch. I am no hero worshiper, but General O'Daniel is the type of man who makes me proud he is an American. This is in a six page Twix that he sent back to the Secretary of the Navy recommending Iron Mike for the Navy Distinguished Service Medal. And then President Eisenhower in his memoir said, one of our outstanding combat soldiers, despite his nickname and tough exterior, he was a man of great ability and tact. And then I love, I love the top quote, my service to my country has brought me a full measure of satisfaction, but the biggest kick I got was being promoted to corporal on the Mexican border. I think uh, that sort of illustrates where his priorities were as a, as a leader. And then uh, in the middle of the fighting in the Vosges, after a month and a half of heavy fighting in the south of France in the heat, he wrote a general officer, a general order saying, officers are never tired. Any indication by an officer he is tired is epidemic with the many commands. Therefore, that word is taboo. Now, the... The two quotes, the next quotes, lieutenants die like flies, but we gain ground. Good luck. We got that from one of his replacement lieutenants who became a good friend of ours that uh, went on to be a colonel in the army, a retired. Um, and then there are three divisions, one in the line, one in the hospital, and one in the cemetery. And I guess the bottom quote from, this is supposedly from Nathan Bedford Forrest. He's usually misquoted because uh, I don't think he said fuss this, but as it was, this sort of illustrate, illustrates Iron Mike's leadership style. How do you get there first with the most? Well, you've got to coax, cajole, push, pull, cuss, pray, and use hard tactics. And this is what he said to, to the, the gathering of all these illustrious senior officers from the Army and the infantry in the opening comments for the 1946 Infantry Conference that he hosted at Fort Benning. Now, Iron Mike, outside of the third division and maybe a couple mentions in the history books, sort of faded from memory. But there was a local historian in the village of Ostheim, France, named Jean-Jacques Sturm, who in the 1990s was doing the history of his village during the war and learned about the decisive role that the third division played. So he convinced his town council to name 
a street after General O'Daniel in the village and requested from the division PAO a portrait of the general and a, and a set of the division colors. And they have it. So at least in the small village in Elsass, they remember General O'Daniel. And finally, this is his headstone at the Rosecrans Military Cemetery in San Diego. You'll notice Lieutenant General U.S. Army doesn't mention World War I, doesn't mention Vietnam, and it doesn't list any of his awards. A very simple, straightforward headstone for a simple, straightforward, aggressive, hard-charging, relentless, tireless commander. Real quick, if you're interested, I have about four minutes before I open up for questions. I'd like to show you a film. It includes General O'Daniel, but it's the Medal of Honor Award Ceremony for Audie Murphy in Salzburg in June of 1945. That's the airfield in Salzburg uh, with General Patch and several other dignitaries arriving. There's General O'Daniel, General Patch, and a group of nine senators that were visiting in the wake of the American victory and or the Allied victory in World War II. Here come the soldiers to be honored. The, you'll be seeing Audie Murphy shortly. He's a small guy on the far right. Unfortunately, the signal corps didn't have the uh, audio on at the time, so we can't hear O'Daniel's voice. I had the good fortune of locating and corresponding with the adjutant of the third division, who was the man reading the orders at the time, who told me that uh, when Patch and Audie Murphy were speaking, that uh, what General Patch said is, are, are you as nervous about this as I am? So uh, interesting piece of history. So ladies and gentlemen, that concludes my presentation. I am now capable of take or willing to take questions. If you would use the question icon uh, at the bottom of the screen or at the top of your screen uh, to submit your questions, I'll pass them on over uh, to Tim. Um, his comments to lieutenants during the war. Uh, you said you knew one uh, colonel who survived. How, how was that comment taken by his young officers, especially new replacements? The feedback that we received was, holy cow, what have we gotten into? Uh, we, we, we actually have two, two retired 06s who who were lieutenants that came in. One came in October of 44 and the other came in in March of 45. And that was his, basically his basic pitch was, guys, be ready. Because I'm not gonna cut you slack. You're gonna do your duty. The faster we get this done, the less people are going to die. I don't, I don't think he was out there to do warm fuzzies. He didn't seem the warm fuzzy guy. What was the, do you know what the casualty rate was for his division? I don't know what the rate was, but it's the top. He had the highest, third division had the highest uh, casualties in World War II of any division. Okay. Uh, about 32,000 casualties. Um, the estimate is, is they, they, they had over 100,000 people rotate through the third division in the course of the war through replacement and, and everything like that. So basically the third division was rebuilt a total of three times. It's sort of like the first infantry division had a high casualty rate. Right. Okay, anyone have questions?
oh, the guy who raised his hand doesn't have a question now. So, <laughs> um, but um, uh, do you, can you go into more details of what he disagreed with that the, uh, when he broke from the Vietnam, the Friends of the Vietnam? So the, the Friends of Vietnam, which included a, a great many uh, prominent politicians of the time, had soured on President Diem as an effective leader for the Republic of South Vietnam. So the first step they took to show their displeasure, they started cutting funding uh, for the Vietnamese army. But the thing that really irked initially uh, General O'Daniel is, is the, the Friends were funding the University of Hue and they just, they voted to discontinue financial support of the university in Hue. Okay. So he resigned as the president of the army of the uh, American Friends of Vietnam, but remained a member of the board. And then when they said, and the government, the U.S. government started saying, we need to remove President Ziem, he resigned in in protest of this lack of support for a man he thought was the only hope for the future of South Vietnam. Um, going back to his, his career, uh, you look at his mentors. Did he ever recognize how strong a, a bench he had in mentors? His, I mean, he uh, he had an incredibly good relationship with Mark Clark. He, he I have a letter that, uh, let me share that with you. It's, uh, it's a really great letter. If I can find it. Oh, I got it here. When uh, O'Daniel's division was leaving Fifth Army, I mean, they'd been together not only in World War I, but then again from uh, the summer of 42 all the way until 1944, February of 44. So this is from General Clark on 26, uh, 21 June 1944, right after he'd promoted him to two-star. Dear Mike, after these many months of close cooperation, I find it very painful to see the 3rd Division leave the fold of 5th Army I regret to see its commander depart after continuing on Italian soil in 1944. A present association started in 1917 during the first war. Wish to thank you for your assistance, cooperation, and to congratulate you for a job superbly executed. I extend my heartfelt best wishes for the future. And then, uh, and I, and Mike says, it is with extreme regret the 3rd Division leaves 5th Army. We consider it a smooth running machine and recognized by all as the most efficient Army we have. We look forward to the day when we will come back, having served with you as 2nd Lieutenant and Major General, commanding 3 ID under you, I consider the greatest of honors. Here's hoping we serve together soon again. I would like to be with you for the kill. So I think the Clark relationship is paramount out of that whole bunch. Uh, I don't think it hurt that General uh, Kruger wrote really good efficiency reports for him, but the, the, the connection, of course, broke when one went to Europe and one went to Pacific. Um, I think Colonel Baltzell with the Triple C and the 22nd had a good impact on him. And interestingly enough, I didn't get to cover it in the presentation. It's in the book. His regimental commander in Nogales, Arizona, name of Earl Carnahan, was a sounds like an incredibly fascinating individual, high standards, but used old army methods to try to to teach not just his lieutenants but his troops. So I think those are probably about the three guys I think uh, might have had the most impact. He never wrote it. I mean, I could never find personal papers. All I got is his professional stuff. You, uh, this question comes from Ed. He's he's asking in your research, did you find anything that surprised you about the general? Yes, he was a stamp collector. This is, it's not his personality. He's not a sedate, he's not a quiet, he's not a guy who sits for hours on end pasting stamps into books. But then I found a letter from, from one of his uh, seniors at the Delaware who said, yeah, Iron Mike was a, was a stamp collector. And then his step-grandson, Tom Davies said, yeah, I inherited his stamp album. To me, that was that's a surprise. Um, professionally, oof, I, 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 he's pretty much everything that his appearance shows and the outward stuff. That's what he was. Uh, one thing for sure, and it's written by several people, uh, like the ambassador of Vietnam says, he never suffered any self doubts, 
and he was never he never questioned his own certainty on anything so he could be annoyingly certain on his own judgment which could translate into being resistant to advice okay <laughs> uh this question comes from dave how close was he to his son who died in world war ii or did his military career make him a distant father I think he was close until the war. So up until he, uh, his late teenage years, because they were always at the same posts together. The family would go with him to, you know, the old army. He always managed to fund, fund some housing for his family. Uh, I didn't hear anywhere, didn't read anywhere where they were separated other than when the war started. So I don't think he was an absent father. What, what did he talk about the Depression Army? Hmm. He didn't write anything about it, but he just, I think what his, my view of just reading other things about it was, is you do your mission. You take what they give you and to do you best you can. And basic soldier skills don't require a lot of equipment or technology. Marching, rifle marksmanship, bayonet training uh those things you can do fairly inexpensively so in that time it seems to me uh, he, he he like everybody else you just put up with it and did the best you could do you have any commentary on, on african-american or black troops i wish i could have found that i was amazed when i went through the the gillum the gillum board files that you have up at the EA. they're all there the interviews the what everybody thought and Gillum had been his battalion commander for a period at Nogales with the 25th. They didn't interview him. I don't understand. I mean, he may have been in Moscow at the time, not available, but I mean, he had a black company, black battalion, worked with the senior black officer. I'm sure he had his views, but nobody asked him and he never wrote him anywhere. There's a rumored memoir that he had started in his family, but nobody's ever found it. Okay. So where do we get the book? Book plug now. <laughs> it's out there. Uh, you can get it through Barnes & Noble, Casemate, Amazon.com. Uh, I'm surprised nobody asked me why I called it Sharpen Your Bayonets. Okay, I'll ask. Okay, well, he believed in the spirit of the bayonet. He was an infantry guy. So whenever he went somewhere and he wanted to fire up his troops with an aggressive spirit, He'd tell him, sharpen your bayonet, you're going to need it. And so everywhere he went, from, from when he was a company commander all the way, he even had uh, used it as a corps commander in Korea. I've seen op order covers for some of his operations, and the guy's sitting there with a bayonet fixed on his rifle with the word sharpen your bayonet on it. It was all, all, all present for him. What would you like to say in closing? Oh, Thank you very much. You talked about research. What did you have here at the AHEC and what do we still need to gather in? Oh my gosh. Um, primarily, I, you have all his papers. You have 20 boxes of his papers. You have six boxes of his photos. And then you have the old histories. You have the history of the 25th Regiment and all the other officers. You've got the, the great uh, senior officer interviews that were done in the 90s. I think it was because I, I, I got so much material from General Heikus. I got stuff from General Rawson. Uh, for my research for this book, you guys had almost everything I needed. I went to VMI and looked at the Van Fleet papers, went to the Citadel, looked at some of the Clark papers, um, went down to the Augusta Academy, but there was not that much there. Uh, so you were the primary facility. You guys really made the difference on this one. I'll pass it to the director. Thank you. Okay. Anything in closing? Thank you very much for the opportunity. I hope I didn't uh, tire everybody's ears. Tried to make it within an hour so we can all get to do whatever next business we've got. I understand you're going to put this on YouTube. People will be able to watch it. Uh, you can also, I think there's, you might have my contact information. If somebody wants to contact me, if you pass that on to them, if it's a question about the book or has something to offer that I missed, it'd be great. Well, I want to thank you for coming. It was a, it was a great talk. Thank you very uh, much. Someone, yes, you don't hear much about because he he was down at, at you'd hate to say as a division commander at the lower levels. 
Uh, yeah. But uh, uh, someone that made an impact both uh, during World War II and, and in the periods afterwards. Uh, for those, uh, we're going to break pattern here for a couple of weeks. Uh, we're not going to wait two weeks for the next program. Uh, on the uh, 2nd of March, that's a Thursday. We're going to really break pattern, do a, a talk on Thursday, the 2nd of March. We'll have Clay, Chloe Gavin Beatty and Colonel Keith Nightingale. And they're going to talk Gavin at war using the wartime diaries of General Gavin. So Excellent. I invite you to, to come to that talk uh, on the 2nd of, uh, 2nd of March at 7 p.m. Again, thanks for joining us tonight. Again, Tim, thanks for coming along. Anything we can do for you up here, please let me know. Thanks, Mike. I'll be up, I'll be up to get you the copy of the book I owe you. Okay, thank you much. All right, okay. take care. Rock of the morn.